how far it is past. Oh, no, that's about like Okay, as far as the exam is Thursday, we're not going to quite wrap up the stuff today that's on the exam on Thursday. We'll have a little bit of spillover into Tuesday, but not a whole lot. There are two sections that are posted on Moodle already and have been for some time. It is the host parasite relationship, uh, PowerPoints and lecture notes, and then it's the line one and line two of defense. Um, I've posted actually both exam three and four because this year I'm covering things in a little bit different order. So traditionally what I've done is I've done, prior to doing the host parasite, doing chemotherapy, antibiotics, and other chemicals used in chemotherapy. I'm gonna put that at the end of the class. So it's a little confusing if you look at last year's exam because there's some chemotherapy stuff first, and then it's line one and line two, and then we didn't quite finish line two on the fourth exam, so you have to kind of look at the you know, two-thirds of the third exam and then one-quarter of the fourth exam to get a reflection of the material. So I wanted to make sure you understood that. Uh, same format, uh, pretty much same number of questions um, as you've had the first two exams. Okay. Okay, so we're uh, making our way through the second line of defense right now. Remember, that is the innate line of defense. That is one you are born with. It is a product of your genes, basically. And if you have genetic defects, that can compromise one or more portions of that second line of defense. Uh, we've talked about the role that uh, the lymphatic system plays in this, the various white blood cells. And then toward the end, we've been concentrating on some of the more biochemical aspects of the second line of defense. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple more of those today. We will talk about interferon, we will talk about complement, and we may get started on the last one, which is the inflammatory response. So, anybody ever heard of interferon before? Interferon was really a big, hot drug about 15, maybe 20 years ago when it was first discovered. And it really had a lot of promise when it was first discovered because interferon, as it turns out, has very strong antiviral um, activity. And also it has anti-cancer activity. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why interferon hasn't been quite the panacea that everyone thought it would be. But before we do that, we need to uh, kind of give you a little background on what interferon is. It's actually a group of molecules produced by a group of cells. Interferons are all small molecular weight proteins. And they uh, fall into two types, which are illustrated on this particular slide up here. There's a lot of good information in this slide, so this is something you should pay attention to. So interferons fall into the category of being either type 1 or type 2. Type 1 interferon, if you look at the action down here in this particular row, has antiviral action. It actually stimulates the production of antiviral proteins. If you look at type 1 and type 2, there are actually two different types of type 1 interferon. There's alpha interferon and there's beta interferon. Why do we give them different designations if they both have the same basic action, inducing the production of antiviral proteins? Because alphas tend to be produced by one type or two types of cells. Betas tend to be produced by a different type of cell. So the category in terms of alpha, beta, or when we get over here, gamma, 
for type 2 really do illustrate types of cells that are producing that particular small molecular weight protein. What do type 2 interferons do? How are they different from type 1? They don't stimulate the production of antiviral proteins. Instead, type 2 interferons have a different mode of action entirely in terms of the role they play in your immune system. They tend to be immune stimulators. So, type 1 induce antiviral proteins and type 2 are immune stimulators. Type 2 interferons tend to fall into a category of compounds called lymphokines. And lymphokines are a subclass of a group of molecules called cytokines. The term cytokine basically refers to a cell signaling molecule. This is a substance that one cell produces that it influences another cell in some way. Oftentimes, these signaling molecules, when they bind to the receptor cell, activate uh, gene expression and cause the cell to start expressing new genes that it didn't before, and therefore producing new proteins. There's a lot of cytokine signaling going on amongst the cells that make up your immune system. So macrophages produce cytokines, B lymphocytes produce them, T lymphocytes produce them. So, cyto refers to cells. So these are cell signaling molecules. What does lymphokine refer to? That specifically refers to a cytokine produced by a white blood cell. So these are white blood cell produced molecules. So type 2 interferons fall into this category of being a lymphokine. If you look over here at the type 2 interferons, which belong to the class gamma, why do they belong to a different cla uh, class than beta or alpha? They're produced by a different type of cell. These are produced by activated T lymphocytes and also natural killer cells, immune cells. Alpha and beta interferons, which are type 1s, the ones that produce the antiviral proteins, tend to be produced by epithelial cells. Some leukocytes also produce alpha interferon. And then fibroblasts produce beta interferon. You know what fibroblasts are? Fibroblasts are cells that are very common in connective tissue, and they secrete molecules into the environment that form fibrous extensions from those cells, like the reticular fibers found in RES system, or like the car uh, cartilage and collagen found in connective tissue. So when you think fibroblasts, think connective tissue. We also encountered fibroblasts in another context. Uh, there's a lot of fibroblasts in the connective tissue where we find mast cells as well. Remember, mast cells were those cells that can produce inflammatory substances that were kind of like the neutrophils, but they were found in connective tissue. So connective tissue has a lot of fibroblasts, a lot of mast cells, so that's the context you should be thinking of them in. Let's take a look at type 2 interferons just briefly, and then we'll come back to type 1 in a second. So these are produced by activated lymphocytes and natural killer cells. What do they do? One of their primary functions is they stimulate the phagocytic activity of macrophages and neutrophils. Remember, phagocytosis is a really important part of your body's immune defense system. And so once the T lymphocytes and natural killer cells get activated, 
then they start producing chemical signaling molecules to these macrophages and neutrophils. Do your job better. Okay, be more aggressive. Phagocytize more. So this tends to be a positive feedback loop because remember macrophages produce signals that are going to help to activate T lymphocytes. And the T lymphocytes produce signals that help to activate macrophages. So we get this cascading, multiplicative kind of action where the product of one cell reinforces the production of something in another cell that reinforces that first cell. So we get a positive feedback going on. This particular row is kind of interesting right now here. Other names. These are the current ways we name these particular compounds. So when we talk about interferons, you'll hear reference to a type 1 or a type 2 or alpha, beta, and gamma interferon. These are some of the older names that kind of predate this new naming convention. So alpha interferon used to be uh, known as leukocyte IFN because it's produced by leukocytes and it's an interferon. Beta interferon used to be known as fibroblast IFN. Type 2, gamma, used to be known as immune IFN, also known as macrophage activation factor. This makes things confusing in the world of immunology because the naming conventions for especially all of these cytokines and lymphokines are still being formalized. And so in books, you'll sometimes see reference to macrophage activation factor. And if you don't know that that's type 2 gamma interferon, it can be confusing. So I wanted you to be aware of the fact that immunology is in a state of flux, and the fact that particularly naming of compounds is still not completely worked out. Some people tend to use the more traditional names, other people have adopted now the more uh, kind of recently accepted naming convention. So just be aware of that because it does make immunology a little bit uh, dicey sometimes. Type 1 interferon, both alpha and betas, are primarily involved in stimulation of antiviral proteins. And what's interesting is that those type 1 interferons are prophylactic and not curative. What does prophylactic mean? means preventative. Okay. So these type 1 interferons are actually produced <clears throat> by virus infected cells. Does producing that interferon do that virus infected cell any good? No. Nope. It's been infected. Producing interferon is not going to cure that cell. But what happens is that virus infected cell, because it's been infected, has a system activated that causes it to produce interferon. And that diffuses out into the tissues and affects other non-infected cells and causes them to produce an antiviral protein which protects them against infection. So they're sacrificed in the process, the interferon producing cells. But then they produce out this protective chemical which can protect neighboring cells from viral infection. So that's a very important distinction to understand about interferon. Okay, so here's the common kind of uh, scenario that occurs with type 1 interferon and the induction of protection in neighboring cells. One of the things that tends to readily induce 
production of interferon is the infection, infection of the cell by a double-stranded RNA virus. Okay? So what happens? Cell's infected, virus starts taking over the cell, starts making new virus. And so that cell is a gone. Okay? This turns into a virus factor. But that replication is responsible for inducing interferon genes to now become active. So transcription and translation of interferon occurs within this host infected cell. And we start producing this small molecular weight protein interferon. Okay? Well, this cell is a gonorrhea. Okay? So as time passes, this cell is going to lyse and release new virus, which would normally infect neighboring cells. This interferon, however, diffuses into the tissues. And this is an unaffected cell. And this cell has interferon receptors. Now that interferon is present, it binds to those receptors. A signaling pathway is initiated, which ultimately signals transcription of antiviral protein genes in the nucleus. And we start producing these antiviral proteins. But they're produced in an inactive state. So they're kind of sitting there going, okay, if a virus now comes and attacks me and tries to infect me, these inactive antiviral proteins are going to become activated by the virus infection. So here's some of these virus produced from this doom cell. And they start trying to infect this cell, which now has the inactive antiviral proteins. And that activates the antiviral proteins. And they start degrading the viral messenger RNA. They bind to ribosomes and stop protein synthesis. And that halts viral replication. So this particular cell has been protected by the presence of these antiviral proteins. But the only reason they have them is because of the sacrifice that this infected cell made in producing interferon as it's dying. Okay? So what does this do? This really helps to halt the spread of a viral infection. Well, you might appreciate why people were so uh, excited about this because they thought, wow, if we could isolate interferon and give it to someone who is at risk for a viral infection, it would protect their cells and basically prevent them from getting that infection. And so there were all kinds of fantasies about, could we develop an interferon nasal spray, for example, that during cold season you would just spray in your nose, and in the epithelial cells of your respiratory tract and nasal linings and things would be induced to produce inactive antiviral protein, and then if that cell was ever infected by the virus, it would be protected. There was also a lot of hope because uh, there was also some uh, observations that interferon was not only antiviral, but that it also seemed to have some anti-cancer activity. So people were really excited about that too. Well, what was the stumbling block? One of the major stumbling blocks was is that interferon is produced by a very few cells, leukocytes, are very small in number. There's a fair amount of fibroblasts in epithelial tissue, obviously. But interferon is present in such tiny amounts that it would take huge amounts of tissue to produce even a small therapeutic dose of interferon. Now you might say, well, why don't we raise laboratory animals, like a rabbit, for example, and harvest their tissues? and then use their interferon to treat humans. Interferon is species specific. So rabbit interferon will not work on human cells. So we can only get interferon from human cells. So when they first started isolating this stuff, they would have to do tissue culture and grow fibroblasts or epithelial tissue in tissue culture, harvest those cells and extract a small molecular weight protein, and 
you know, one dose, one therapeutic dose of interferon, you know, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, they have isolated and cloned the human interferon gene. So we can now produce interferon with a bacterial host the same way that they produce human insulin at Eli Lilly using a bacteria. So that's driven the cost down tremendously and it has reopened some of these potential therapies for interferon. Unfortunately, interferons have some side effects. And one of the side effects is that, typically speaking, interferon, when it starts being produced in large amounts, makes you feel kind of lousy. And I think I've mentioned this before. Some of these um, early symptoms you feel in the prodromium, remember that term? of the early stages of infection, when you feel like you just know you're getting sick and you just feel kind of yucky, are the result of interferon production early on in that viral infection. So the therapies do have some, uh, some downside. Alex, you have a question? Yeah. Um, what is the like, viruses from mutating to where they get past this kind of thing? Good question. Um, and will it happen? Probably. Yeah. Uh, as of right now, virus have not seemed to evolve um, methods. I mean, it's kind of tricky because I'm not sure what it is about viral replication that induces that interferon gene to become active. Um, so if the virus gets into a cell, it seems to stimulate interferon production. And if a virus is going to infect the cell or replicate, it's got to get inside a cell. So it's not a matter of just kind of having a mutation in a receptor on the virus so it can no longer get in the cell. It's got to get into the cell before interferon is uh, activated. So good question. OK, another part of your body's, <coughs> excuse me, innate. <coughs> Second line of defense is the complement system. The complement system is a mixture of, at least identified right now, 26 different serum proteins. Remember when we talked about, uh, what was the difference between plasma and serum? Do a little review, remember? Um, serum, doesn't serum doesn't have the clotting protein, it's okay. But what does serum still have? It still has the gamma globulins, which are the antibody molecules. It still has things like transferrin and other transport proteins, and it also has complement. What produces these complement proteins? Well, there are some white blood cells that produce complement proteins, and liver cells can produce complement proteins. The most common white blood cells that produce complement are the monocytes and the lymphocytes. Do you remember what monocytes differentiate into? Macrophages. Okay. These particular 26 serum proteins become activated, so one of the things we need to talk about is what activates them, okay? And then they start interacting with one another in a cascade fashion. 
What a cascade means is that the product of one activation stimulates another activation, or stimulates another. So it's kind of a chain reaction type of thing. There are three different pathways in the complement system. And those three pathways are illustrated up here. One is referred to as the classical pathway. One is referred to as the alternative pathway. And one is referred to as the lectin pathway. Classical, alternative, lectin. For reasons that I don't know, the alternate pathway has also been referred to, and you'll see this in many books, as the proparadin pathway. So those are synonymous terms, alternate and proparadin. <coughs> Each of those three pathways is activated in a different way. So that's what makes you part of one pathway or another is how the system is activated. What kicks off the cascade? All three pathways have different pathways. They have different cascades that occur. And I'll show you an example of one of them in a minute. But all three pathways have one outcome that's the same. So all three pathways converge at the same point and do the same thing. They form something called an attack complex. This is a cell <coughs> covered by attack complexes. Basically, it's a little channel that's been created in the surface of the cell, which causes that cell to then lice. So it's like puncturing holes in the surface of that cell. So here is an attack complex that's formed. It's a bunch of proteins that have polymerized together on the surface of the cell within the membrane and basically created a channel. And then things can leak out of the cell through that channel that has been created in the surface. The complement system is most effective <coughs> against gram-negative pathogens. In gram-positives, that peptidoglycan layer is so thick that it's tough to punch holes through that thick peptidoglycan layer. It's pretty easy to form that attack complex though and punch holes in that LPS <coughs> layer and then the cell membrane itself. So each of these particular pathways is initiated by a different event. The classical pathway is initiated by the formation of an antibody against a particular bacterial antigen. The thing that initiates the classical pathway is an antibody binding to an antigen on the surface of a path pathogen. So an antigen-antibody complex is the initiating event in the classical pathway. 
So for this pathway to be activated, your third line of defense has to have kicked in. So think for a minute what that entails. Okay? So a macrophage is going to have to have found that pathogen. And that macrophage is going to then have to present it to a B cell and a T helper cell so those two cells can interact so the B cell can start producing antibody. But once the antibody is being produced, those antibodies will circulate around the body and any time they see the pathogen that stimulated their formation, they're going to bind to it. And then this classical pathway is going to be activated and the pathogen is going to be killed by having holes punched in it by that attack complex. So this is one of the ways in which producing antibodies in your third line of defense helps to protect you because it activates the classical complement pathway. So the, active, the, uh, the classical complement pathway is kind of a generalized killing mechanism for killing pathogens. But it's not kicked into action until a specific antibody stimulates it. So there's a specificity here that's really important. Now, you certainly don't have to know all this stuff. Otherwise, it would probably be mutiny. So this is an example of a classical complement pathway that's been activated. So here's your pathogen. Here's some antigens on its particular surface. And your immune system has been stimulated to produce antibodies that bind to those particular antigens. So we formed an antibody-antigen complex. And now those complement proteins in the blood start interacting with one another. Many of these actions involve activation of proteins that are now enzymes, and those enzymes oftentimes cleave other proteins to produce new products, some of which are enzymes themselves. There's some fairly complex interactions that take place between these various complement proteins, and ultimately they all converge in the formation of this attack complex on the surface of the cell. So you can see that this particular attack complex is the result of the polymerization of C9, that refers to the ninth complement protein, and then there's also involvement of C6, 5B, 7, 8. Those all get put together in the proper fashion as a result of this cascading interaction. Okay, so you can see here. C1 becomes activated as a result of this antigen antibody complex forming, and an active C1 splits C2, C4, etc., etc., etc. So we get all these interesting interactions take place, which terminate in this. There's one other thing that the classical pathway does besides form an attack complex. Some of those complement molecules produce byproducts, which aren't involved in the uh, attack complex. They're not part of the attack complex. <clears throat> Look at this one right down here. C3A, C3B. Those are two of the 26 complement proteins. They're not part of the attack complex. They're kind of byproducts of getting to the attack complex. But these have a function. <clears throat> these molecules act as opsonins. Opsonins enhance phagocytosis. C4A and C4B, they're not part of the attack complex, but they're spun off as byproducts, and what do they do? They stimulate inflammation, which we're about ready to talk about. So a lot of these byproducts right here, there's another one um, that forms, um, yeah, here's another one down here that, that uh, stimulates chemotaxis and triggers inflammation. 
So these particular byproducts of the complement classical cascade are very useful and very important in your immune response. Now, if you were taking an advanced immunology course or an advanced microbiology course, probably one of the things you would be expected to do is to be able to reproduce this complement cascade and to be able to tell what happens where and which thing stimulates which other thing. That's too much detail as far as we're concerned. You do need to understand that all these proteins interact with one another as the product of one affects another protein, ultimately resulting in the formation of attack complexes and then side-produced molecules which work in inflammation and are other immune stimulants. Okay, what induces the alternative pathway? Well, do you see any antibodies involved in this one? No. So these pathways can be activated even before we have an antibody response. What can activate some of these alternative pathways? Molecules that are PAMPs. That's an acronym you should know. Pathogen Associated Molecular Pattern. So it might be a glycoprotein on the surface of a virus. It might be a peptidoglycan molecule. It might be an LPS layer molecule, an endotoxin. But some of those particular PAMPs interact with complement proteins, C3B B in this case, and initiate a different complement cascade. They still result in the formation of an attack complex. But the alternative pathway doesn't spin off these byproducts. So it's more limited. What's the advantage of having this? The activation of the cascade and the attack complex without having to wait for antibodies to form. The final pathway is the lectin pathway. Lectins are molecules that tend to have a high affinity for sugars. And so you've got some lectins that are floating around in your serum. One of the sugars that binds to the lectins that are associated with the complement system is the sugar mannose. Mannose is not common in humans. You don't find that sugar around much, if at all. But mannose is found fairly commonly in bacterial cells. So it almost becomes kind of a de facto, mark, de facto marker for a bacterial cell. If your body sees mannose, it thinks bacteria. Respond. So what's the initiating event here? Lectins in your blood bind to mannose on the sugar of bacterial cells. And that initiates a cascade of complement. And ultimately, where does it go? The cascade results in an attack complex eliminating this particular cell. But this doesn't produce any of the side mediators or byproducts as well. So it's only the classical system that gives you that added bonus of using some of the byproducts as immune stimulants, stimulators of inflammation, etc. <clears throat> If a transfusion occurs between mismatched blood, is that a problem? Yes, it is, right? Because antibodies in the transfused blood are interacting with cells in your circulatory system. 
What is your perception of why that's bad for you? Why is it bad that those antibodies in the transfused blood are interacting with your blood? Why is it lethal? Why does it kill you? Has anybody ever done blood typing? Or simulated blood typing? You mix some cells and some serum containing antibodies together, and what if those antibodies match the antigens on your blood cell? It clumps, right? So most people assume that the problem in a blood transfusion that occurs when you get mismatched blood is that the antibodies and antigens interact and the blood clumps and it clots. That's not what happens. What instead happens is, is that those antibodies interact with the cells and stimulate the complement cascade. And that stimulates the lysis of your red blood cells. And so that's what kills you in a mismatched transfusion. It is not clumping or clotting of the blood. It is activation of the blood's complement system and lysis of the red blood cells. One of the most important parts of your innate line of defense, second line innate, is inflammation. And I can guarantee everybody in this room has had an inflammatory response initiated in your body at some particular time. What can initiate inflammation? Injury. That injury can be mechanical. You might twist an ankle, for example. It could be a burn. What else can initiate inflammation? Infection can infl initiate inflammation. And certain cancers can initiate inflammation. Additionally, if you suffer from allergies, you are also suffering from inflammation. What are the signs of inflammation? How do you know inflammation is occurring? Or considered to be four classical signs or indicators of inflammation. Really? Okay. Swelling. Swelling. Redness. Pain? Heat. Heat. Tumor, ruber, dolor, and calor. Those are Latin words for swelling, redness, pain, and heat. Not color, sorry, calor. People have known about inflammation for a long time. So what are the causes? Well, we've listed what some of the causes of that particular can be. But why does this particular process take place? I mean, this is a listing of what appears to be negative outcomes of this particular process. A lot of these are unpleasant. But what are the benefits associated with this process? And why do these symptoms, because these are basically a list of symptoms as well, why do these symptoms develop? What's going on?
Well, there's three major goals for initiation of inflammation. One is to bring immune cells to the site of injury. Some of the things that are going to be helpful to that particular location. The second goal of inflammation is to initiate healing and repair of the tissues. And the third goal of inflammation is to kind of limit your activity, to cause you to back off and give your body a chance to repair itself. Now, there are things that can be done to suppress inflammation and to mitigate these particular symptoms, particularly the swelling and the pain. But is that a good thing to do? Well, that's some good questions, okay? Because if this was the result of a mechanical injury, if you take steroids, for example, which can tamp down the inflammatory response, then you might keep doing what you were doing when you got injured and injure yourself worse. So inflammation can have this protective, forcing you to kind of back off a little bit. Function. Inflammation is the result of various cells of the body some of which are white blood cells, some of which aren't, and cytokines that they produce, these chemical signaling molecules. So one of the things that we're going to look at next time is what are some of the major cells involved in the inflammatory response, what cytokines do they produce, and then how does the production of those cytokines lead to these particular symptoms? And how does it facilitate meeting these particular goals of helping you to <coughs> heal and recover from that particular injury or infection which caused the inflammation to occur in the first place? The other thing we'll throw in at the very end next time is the role that fever plays kind of in conjunction with inflammation. So we'll throw that in there. So I would guess probably it's only going to take us about 15 minutes at the beginning of next period. And then that will leave time for any questions you might have. Or if not, I will just kind of move on to the next material for exam number four.